The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Department of Special Needs Ministries webinar, Mental Health and Spirituality. My name is Rachel Chung, Disabilities Coordinator for the Archdiocese of Washington, Department of Special Needs Ministries. In today's webinar, we will explore how our faith, our Catholic community, can be a source of strength, comfort, and support during difficult times. We recognize mental health is important during every part of our lifespan, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and the elderly. The mental health issues vary depending on the life stage and the life circumstances, as we can observe from our own experience as parents and ministry volunteers or parish staff. For the purposes of today's webinar, we will focus on adults. Please stay tuned for future webinars focusing on the mental health needs of children and adolescents. Later in the webinar, Jean Harris, President and Interim Director of NOMNI DC, will join us to share how our faith communities can serve people living with mental illness and their families. So what is mental health wellness? I attended a seminar recently on mental health and the presenter asked the participants, what does mental health wellness mean to you? The seminar participants had various responses. Some people in the seminar said mental health wellness is feeling well in mind, body, and spirit. Others said mental health wellness is a healthy balance between home and professional life. For other people, systems of support were important, or they were able to access those systems of support when they were stressful life events that they encountered. For many people, prayer and fellowship meant mental health wellness. People also mentioned that feeling of fulfillment. They felt fulfilled in all aspects of their life. So what does it mean to you? What do you think when you hear this term, mental health wellness? We speak of mental wellness, and in turn, we have to have the other side, which is mental illness. Mental illness, as defined by the Mayo Clinic, is also called mental health disorders, refers to a wide range of mental health conditions disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. Examples of mental illness include depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and addictive behaviors. Different events in our lives, such as the death of a loved one or loss of a job, can lead to feelings of depression or anxiety. This is not necessarily a mental illness, a person experiencing these different life events may seek out professional counseling or other supports, such as a support group, during those times. And in time, they're able to adapt and change and cope with their new reality. Mental illness is when the symptoms of sadness or hopelessness, for example, persist and they impact significantly the person's daily life. Mental illness is a brain disorder requiring a medical intervention. But still, as a church community, we need to surround the person and the family. This is the types of supports we can offer as a church community. So why explore this topic today? According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, one in five adults will experience a mental health crisis this year. So it is a very strong possibility that people in our parishes, people sitting next to us uh, in church are experiencing a mental health crisis. Studies have shown that people experiencing a mental health crisis often first turn to their faith leader 
whether that person is the pastor, priest, rabbi, and their faith community for help. We are often the first place that people turn to when they're experiencing that mental health crisis. People find strength and healing in attending Mass, Eucharistic Adoration, prayer, reading scripture, and many more other parts of our Catholic faith. I've met many people as well that live with chronic mental illness that really find comfort and strength in sitting in the presence of the Lord during Eucharistic adoration. It's a great source of strength for many people. The sacrament of anointing for the sick is for everyone who is experiencing an illness, including a mental illness. So this sacrament um, is a part of healing and it's a beautiful sacrament in our faith, but it is for everyone experiencing illness, including a mental illness. And of course, we are not a whole church when we are missing members. When people are not present in our church, they don't feel welcome. We're not a whole community. During the installation mass for Archbishop Wilton Gregory, the gospel reading was from the Gospel of Mark. And in this gospel, which many of us are familiar with, Jesus is actually asleep on the boat uh, as a storm suddenly comes up. The apostles, some of whom were experienced fishermen and used to life on the sea, actually became very frightened with this storm. And the apostles cry out to Jesus, teacher, don't you care if we perish? Jesus immediately calms the storm in the wind. The apostles are amazed Jesus has the power to even tell the winds to be still. In the Archbishop's homily during this installation mass, he reminded us that we too have experienced storms in our own personal life and of course in the current crisis of the church. And Archbishop Wilton Gregory had to remind us, uh, just as the apostles, we questioned Jesus, don't you care, Jesus, that we are perishing? And he reminded us that actually Jesus was right there in the boat with the apostles, and he is right there with us as well today, whenever we have storms in our lives. He never left us. So now we will bring in our guest speaker, Jean Harris. Jean is the current president and interim executive director of the Nomni DC chapter. Jean has partnered with us here at the Department of Special Needs Ministries on various events and outreach initiatives. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jean. Thank you for inviting me, Rachel. Uh, it is an honor and pleasure to be a part of this webinar to talk about mental illness and the faith community, my relationship with the church. I am Catholic, and so I identify with all of the teachings and of the church. The next, yes, yeah, so um, Jean, can you please explain a little bit about what is Nomni? We haven't mentioned yes. actually what does Nomni do? And, and, and what, First what, of what all, does... I'll tell you what the acronym Nomni means. The acronym Nomni means the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It is a national and international organization, the largest one in existence to nonprofit to provide support, education, and advocacy for families and individuals living with mental illness. I am the Washington, D.C. Executive Director for the Washington, D.C. Affiliate. So, Jean, can you share a little bit about your experience in your role with Nomni D.C., working with faith communities? Yes, I've been with NAMI for over 30 years. I came when my son was first diagnosed with a serious mental illness. And so I've been there a long time and I've watched the growth and collaboration between church and other organizations, especially ones like NAMI. Uh, we have become more engaged in activities right here at the disability office, mm -hmm. being able to share and partner so the word can get out that mental illness 
is a recoverable illness and that fears many times prevent the uh, reaching out to receive the services that an individual needs. And many times the faith community has not felt as comfortable as it should in helping persons with mental illness. Yes, and sometimes actually people living with mental illness have not had welcoming experiences yes, as yes, well. That is absolutely true. So why do you think it is important for people living with mental illness to connect to their faith community? Why, why is that important that we're even doing this webinar? and helping Well, I people think connect? it's important for number one, I think people of faith, that is one of the first places they look to for support. And so the faith community gives them an assurance that I'm okay, I'm still loved by, by God, my faith still recognizes and accepts me. So I guess the key thing to me, it's important because it's a first level of acceptance. Mm -hmm. If my church accepts me, then that also means that Christ, God accepts me, and then I'm looking for the community to accept me. So to me, it's an avenue to acceptance. Wow, that's very well said. And and that's why we always mention uh, here at the Department of Special Needs Ministries, when we're missing people, we're not a whole church. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So how has your own faith guided you and helped you in your own experience supporting a loved one living with mental illness? My faith has helped me a lot. And my son was a very devoted Catholic. He never missed Mass. He would go uh, every Sunday and he, he participated in all of the functions. But he got to a point where he recognized that that was not enough. And uh, because of my background and my nursing background, mm -hmm. we sought out medical interventions to add to his faith base. And that's when we saw a decided change in his recovery status. Mm -hmm. Yes, because you needed to have both. You needed <laughs> to have both. You need both. You, you need your faith in addition to the medical or whatever um, approach you use to caring for your disability. And I won't call it a disability. I'll call it a condition in life that you may be in at that point in life. Mm, yeah, very well said. So what do you think the role of faith and prayer specifically, or um, maybe our Catholic uh, sacraments and mass, what, what role do you think they have in a person's recovery? Because as you mentioned, mental illness is a, a, a illness that can be recovered. Right, a absolutely. person can go into yeah, a, yeah. a recovery from that. I think the I think the faith plays a major role. But I'd like to say, Rachel, that I think the church body needs to become more comfortable with the idea of how we, my words, respect or embrace a person with mental illness. There's still fear. There's still avoidance. And I believe the avoidance is because of the fear. And so once we can break down that fear and stigma and feeling afraid, we can better embrace like we do other illnesses. Mm, uh -huh. uh, I, this is not my original thought, uh, but this has been said many times in NAMI. As individuals, we can address the illness of the body from the neck down without any difficulty at all. We offer <laughs> prayers of healing. We acknowledge that. We visit them in the hospital. They, we visit and show great support. But when the illness is from the head up, which includes mental illness, there's a silence, uh, not recognized necessarily, not spoken of, not prayed about. And individuals will tell you they don't get as many visits from their faith community mm -hmm. when the illness is a mental illness as it is with a biological um, illness in any other part of the body. Yes. It's, so that's something for us to think about, to embrace the whole person. That's right. And and we discussed many times, Jean, about that stigma that yes. is so pervasive, even as attitudes have changed. It's, it's very, very right, strong. Right. Um, so 
what advice then, Jean, you've been in this uh, many, many years um, as a professional, a family member, um, and also as a leader with mm. Nomni DC, what advice would you give a faith community, such as a Catholic parish or could be another yeah. kind of congregation, considering starting an outreach or a ministry to support people living with mental illness and their family members? I think one of the things I would share with them is that utilize organizations like NAMI mm -hmm. who have already put in place programs that could benefit the parish and the church. They don't necessarily have to start from scratch. <laughs> we have a program within NAMI called Faith Net, where we're trying to collect, connect with the leaders in the churches uh, to help them understand and to teach them what to say, how to say, what they need to say in order to encourage their members to seek help for their illness if it is beyond their scope to to assist them anymore. We have other programs like Family to Family where, mm -hmm. where families can come to a class and learn the signs and symptoms of mental illness and what their response should be to the individual and how to embrace. My point is always in embracing the individual and including them within the circle of the recovery. Uh, there are support groups available for individuals and their families to talk about and share how one works towards recovery. And recovery is, is no matter what state that individual is, um, whatever and wherever they are, one step above is recovery. Right. And it's not measured according to a global definition, but by each individual's um, transformation from being a critically ill to gradually moving into a more functioning, independent state. Yeah, and th that's great advice. I think sometimes with our ministry formation, uh, people are stuck in the uh, how of it. <laughs> they don't think about why. Yes. So the how has been done by NAMI. Yes. <laughs> how can we have programs and yes. outreach? And we can be a welcoming community Absolutely. for those programs. And, and I'm going to add to that because one of the ways we can do that, we come into the churches, we work with them, in presenting programs or sharing and cooperating like I'm doing on this webinar exactly. today to share um, what we do as well as what the church is doing and moving into doing. And being a Catholic, I can speak to that right? because right. I am a member of the body of this That's faith. right, a body yes. of this faith. Yes. So we talked a little bit about the support programs and um we have family to family, which is really working with those family members right. um, and also other types of support groups. Um, what about our, our nominees outreach to our returning veterans? Because especially yes. in our Archdiocese of Washington, we, we know we have right, many right. veterans that are returning home Thank and you. their unique yeah. issues. Yeah. Thank you for calling me to mind on that. We have a program called Homefront that is particularly geared for veteran families, families returning mm -hmm. uh, to help them also nav navigate and get back into a state of recovery. Many of these veterans are already connected to VA mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. sources, but what we find that NAMI's home front includes the family member in the process and it helps the recovery and moving into the next step. My advice is I think that a family needs to be included in the process. That ends the stigma as well. Mm -hmm. It's just between I and my psychiatrist or I and the priest. We're not asking to be included in private conversation, but the one that addresses the whole individual. It takes a village or a community to right. help support that individual. And I know also one of the signature programs of Nomni, and I know some of our own parishes have hosted, which is in our own voice. Yes. So again, that gives that opportunity, or, or can you tell us a little yes. more about that? Yeah. In yeah. Our Own Voice is another great program that we offer. And the In Our Own Voice program are individuals who have lived experience 
or are living the experience of a mental illness. And they talk about the stages they went through from their crisis stage up into their recovery stage and their functional stage. And again, that's different from each person that have gone from being very chronically ill and to moving into a phase where they now have been able to return back to work and been able to do things and reconnect and even marry if they're not married or be able to be a functioning member of that family structure. So that's a program that we give in the parishes. And we've done that in several parishes um, in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah, excellent. So again, that helps our, our faith community to reduce that stigma <laughs> that's around mental illness and also that our places of our church community are places of welcome yes. <laughs> where everyone belongs. So now here's a very difficult topic. We know Jean, um, yes. uh, and, but it is a part of uh, mental illness. Um, we know. So what are your thoughts on um, suicide and, and the changes you've observed um, in our faith communities regarding uh, suicide. And, and we know this is a very difficult topic yeah, for many people. Right. But Well, I know in our faith community, and, and uh, I've been with NAMI a long time, and I've been Catholic quite a while, that suicide was not necessarily a positive entity or in our faith. So I'm going to just put that on the yeah, table right, right now. And it's most recently, I believe after Vatican II, that it is now talked about, not in a negative sense, but in a more positive sense. People are supported, they're encouraged um, to identify and talk about it. Uh, in NAMI, we say that suicide is like the number of people with, um, the number of people with mental illness. The prevalence of suicide is quite high, yes. and we always think it is in young people, mm -hmm. but NAMI statistics now show that it is happening as much in the elder population. That's right. What we consider as a normal demise many times are acts of suicide. So what do we do? We um, listen, we encourage, and again, when, or my perspective and NAMI's perspective, when you hear the word suicide, we shouldn't be frightened or we should not not even talk about it because talking about it does not necessarily mean that will encourage suicide, but will encourage the individual to think in a different direction or recognize that he or she can talk to somebody who can understand what he or she is saying and maybe make recommendations as to what other modes or methods are available instead of suicide. So suicide is now more talked about and more open, even in the faith community yes. than it was before. Yeah, and, and I know, Jean, you and I talked about that in the past, our, our, um, and in our own faith, yeah. some families felt that um, rejection regarding someone who did die by suicide right. and they weren't offered a mass um, or being able to be buried in uh, in consecrated ground. And so I'm glad we had that opportunity to say that our Catholic faith uh, does not teach that. A person who does die by suicide, that mass is a vital per part, part for yes, that family yes, to, yes. to heal. Um, but of course, prevention is what we want uh, before we that. Want. Um, yeah. So that gives us that, again, that opportunity for our faith community to surround that family in that time. Um, and it also gives the family an opportunity to not keep the secret. Yes. And to yeah. be open like they can be. I don't mean we're signed, but at least people you trust and you can feel more secure in that uh, process if it happens. Yeah, that's prevention, right. Prevention, you're right, is what we try mm -hmm. to do is prevent that process or even discussing it and talking about it beforehand. So now these are for our faith leaders yes. because we talked a little yes. much about what our faith community, our Catholic community can do, but uh, what advice would you have for our clergy, our, our pastors, our priests um, regarding supporting people living with mental illness and their families? 
because as you mentioned, people do turn to their pastor um, or a priest that they might know well or not at all (laughs) because they're experiencing a mental health crisis. What advice would you have for for our our faith leaders? I think our faith leaders need to be comfortable in recognizing when someone, and even in confession, when Mm -hmm. someone is speaking uh, beyond the scope of where they are in terms of listening and giving advice. Uh, Many times individuals are in the height of their crisis or have chronic conditions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and continually they go to their faith leaders and repetitively talk about that crisis. And I think faith leaders need to be able to at some point recognize that this is beyond the scope that I am able to work with and recommend that that individual seek help from another source. Uh, And I think that is the most powerful thing you can do because as a NAMI member and president, I've heard many people complain and had negative feelings about they felt that they were told just to pray. And they have prayed and prayed and nothing (laughs) has happened. And so... They need to be given an honest truth that pray, but I would suggest you see a professional because uh, this is not changing for you. So I think all of our faith leaders need to be able to recognize when to, and I don't mean necessarily to to refer to a psychiatrist. My mode, I usually tell folks is, Refer them to their primary doctor. Maybe this is something you need to talk to your doctor about to gently get them to recognize they need maybe steps to get to where they really need to get to in order for them to receive the help. And I honestly believe, Rachel, that many of our pastors and priests are not comfortable in that area. That's not taught right, anywhere. Right. That's a life lesson you learn somewhere else. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, and you need to be able to be comfortable with it. I know some priests that are social workers, so they're more yeah, comfortable right. with that than others who that's not their background. Right. right. So that's what we're trying to do, get other people. Uh, and it's not only the Catholic faith. I know that's yes. what we focus yeah, on today, today. Mm-hmm. but they all faith that the... Uh, the leaders need to recognize that uh, they would not try to fix a heart condition. That's right. They wouldn't. So do that an just came to my mind. They would not try to complete a heart condition surgery. Yeah. Or surgery. <laughs> they would say pray, but I would. They would certainly say seek out your doctor right. or surgeon. We need to get the same way with mental health and mental illness. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Again, it's part of a medical condition. That's right. Um, and, and, but our prayer and our faith are still those integral parts. And They and sustain a, us they sustain through us. the treatment and the process. That's right, that's right. Um, wow, thank you so much, Jean, for, for all your insights. And what we'd like everyone to do now is please uh, type in your questions or comments and you should see to the right-hand side of your screen a, a chat box. Um, so please, we'll give you some time to think. And uh, we certainly welcome also comments, but certainly questions as well. Um, as we just present a few more resources, we'll give you time for that uh, to think about some questions and comments that you might have. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this, Jean, but uh, Let me share some thoughts with everyone on how we can respond as a Catholic church to people living with mental illness um, and their families. Uh, First off is, of course, to reach out to people and their family members um, experiencing a mental health crisis. Again, there's a lot of stigma around mental illness still in our society, but it's very important that we reach out and let them know that we are there for them. There's two opportunities throughout the year where we can also do it in our uh, church-wide awareness building. First, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And in October, uh, one week in October is designated as Mental Illness Awareness Week. So we can include intentions for those living with mental illness in our prayers of the faithful uh, during Mass. And there's some examples 
even of petitions already written on the National Catholic Partnership on Disabilities website. They have examples of uh, intentions that we can include during those months or other months, but uh, these are two good times that we can, as parishes, create that awareness. Now, if appropriate, and I know Jean would agree with me, um, a confidentiality is a very key part of mental illness, and I think any illness as well, um, that we need to respect that and, and kind of take the lead of the person and the family in mm -hmm. that respect. But again, uh, Jean mentioned that sometimes people feel so isolated when they're hospitalized from a mental illness crisis, um, and they still want to be ministered mm -hmm. to in many cases. And we do have people that bring Holy Communion to someone that's had a surgery. Mm -hmm. and um, But if appropriate, and that person and the family members feel like that's uh, something sure. they want, um, we should also include them in our visits for Holy Communion. Again, that confidentiality is that very critical piece for this. Um, and we just follow the lead of that person yes. and their families with, with that. But again, our Holy Communion is a source of strength for people. So we need to bring that to them um, in those times. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, many of our parishes do have anointing of the sick service, or it could be also part of the Sunday Mass, depending on your parish. And, and us as um, members of the parish or ministry leaders or staff, we should also be reaching out to those, again, respecting confidentiality, um, to those services of anointing of the sick. Because as we mentioned um, earlier, that sacrament is available for anyone experiencing an illness, including a mental illness. And I think, Rachel, what is important just to say that right. this is for everybody, including them with mental illness. And, and when they come, when everybody else comes, the confidentiality is not breached. That's right. That's so that's right. where People you don't just, know. <laughs> you don't know and you don't yeah. ask questions, but you make it open so they will know that they are invited. Exactly. Yeah. And again, they can, they don't have to share what they illness know, they have during their service. Their that's right. So why, yeah. <laughs> unless they want to. Yeah, unless they, unless they, choose, they to, yeah. choose to. So again, we have these beautiful sacraments that need to also be available to everyone in our faith community. Mm -hmm. And as Jean mentioned very well, for our leaders, our clergy, again, our pastors and priests, um, we can uh, and help and train here at the Archdiocese as well and us uh, that they know the signs when additional help might be needed for the person. Because there are times when uh, additional help, like we said, uh, a priest would not consider doing a heart surgery for someone. Mm -hmm. They would recommend prayer and sacrament, but also please see your doctor as well. And again, um, we Nomni has a whole variety of programs that um, are, are there and, and brought by people living with mental illness and family members. So uh, consider having a Nomni program in your parish. I know several of our parishes have hosted the uh, family to family program and they've also hosted nominee programs yeah. where the families educated on mental illness um, and support groups. So we can definitely have our church space available as well. And again, just like any outreach we do, we do not have to be experts to reach out. Um, uh, we just have to be that willingness and open heart to, to make sure all are included. So let me share again. Um, please feel free again to type in your questions or comments in that box to your side, right-hand screen. We do have some specific outreaches available in our uh, Archdiocese of Washington. Uh, one is a prayer and rosary uh, mass held at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And please, when you go there, go ahead to the Queen's Chapel. This is where this mass is held at 2 p.m. every fourth Saturday. Uh, but you do have to find, there's many chapels, if you're not familiar with uh, the Basilica, <laughs> it's the Queen's Chapel is where this Mass um, and Rosary is held. And it's, again, it's a very open gathering to family members and those living with mental illness. And that's on the fourth Saturday of the month at 2 p.m. And also for those experiencing uh, 
post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, in St. Patrick's uh, Catholic Church in Rockville, Maryland. There is a ministry called Upper Room Ministry, and that's a support group for those experiencing uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And that outreach has been there for many years now and available and open. Also at the Department of Special Needs Ministries, we have uh, pew cards. Uh, here's the example we have, and again, it's a two-sided uh, card. And please contact us at the Department of Special Needs Ministries if you would like to have these um, at your parish to, again, build that awareness, reducing that stigma. Um, and Jean and others were involved with us in developing this uh, pew card. And that's why we have breaking the silence as part of that, uh, where the more we talk about it, the more we can create that outreach and, and open atmosphere in our churches. So these are available at no cost uh, as well. And it's also available on the Archdiocese of Washington website if you'd like to download that as well. But please contact us if you would like copies of those. And it is available also in Spanish. So please uh, feel free again to write any of your questions or comments um, for us. And Jean and I are, are ready here to, to answer your questions. But um, uh, Jean, tell us a little bit, though, about, um, as we're waiting for people to type in their questions, um, yes. uh, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about that recovery. Um, yes that it is possible. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit about that for some or a lot of mental illness. Um, it's a chronic condition, right? Just like uh, diabetes maybe or um, other types of conditions. So and, talk and, a little bit about okay. that recovery. And that is why I use recovery and not cure because there's a big difference. Recovery means that you're not always in crisis but you're able to function at the maximum of your ability and potential at any given point. So that's why we say um, that recovery. So I want people to be clear that recovery does not mean cure. Mm, right, right. So that's, that's the big difference. But recovery means that you can maintain and function on a level that you could not function at when you were in crisis. Right. And again, you need to recognize that for each individual, that can be a different, uh, recovery can look different. Right, exactly. Uh, I've seen all scopes of recovery from people going back to school, going back mm, to graduate mm -hmm. schools, even becoming lawyers and et cetera. The illness is still there. The illness still needs to be maintained. You've used diabetes, that's yeah, my absolutely. pet one, two, because yes, I take that from you, Jean. Because your diabetes, example. you can manage that, mm -hmm. but you're not cured of that. That's right. And managing uh, mental illness can move you into recovery, but management and recovery go together. Right. If you prescribe medications, if you prescribe certain uh, therapies, then those have to be included in mm. the management and recovery process. Right. And so that's what I mean. It's in recovery that I get to the point where I don't need this anymore. Right. Recovery means it's an ongoing process with the individual participating in that process. Yeah, very well said. And we do have a question for the seminar taken from a different way. Um, this question is, how can you best help people with mental illness who are in denial or the families in denial? Oh, yes. <laughs> so this is a question from one of our uh, uh, faith leaders here. And, and that's that's very true. Um, <laughs> there are different ways of doing it. I'm, I'm just trying to think every time when people are in denial. Uh, that's one of the reasons I said approach it from another angle. Mm -hmm. To keep saying you have a mental illness or what have you and they haven't been diagnosed. You talk about the symptoms that are presented in front of you. I notice that you're not sleeping a lot. Mm, I notice that okay. you're up all night. I notice you're losing weight, which is one of the signs of depression. I notice different. So you talk about what is observable and you talk about those things. Um, are you concerned about that? So you help the individual begin to see Definitely. or experience what you're talking about. Or are you interested in going to find out what it is? 
So we don't just necessarily go right to the mental <laughs> okay. illness component where right. that person is in denial. And even families, I've talked to families too, they will tell you how much of a genius this individual is. And I will say always that mental illness and intelligence are two different entities. Because if you look at this, um, when we do our talks many times, we talk about those geniuses who had mental illnesses, but still were able to perform managing somewhat their illness. And those that didn't manage did not go into recovery as quickly. Mm, right. Yeah. Right. And, and sometimes I think that's good advice. And thank you for that question. Um, because I think sometimes we just have to change the way we're speaking that, to right. those families and individuals yes. and um, kind of those things that are very factual, observable, yes, yes. because for them, again, that stigma is just so hard. And I it think is. when we use that word mental illness, that might just close their mind to help. And, and the pain is a different kind of a pain. Mm. And that's mm. what also prevents people from acting. I always use the one about the toothache. When you have a toothache, you don't hesitate to go to the dentist. <laughs> right. And you don't say, well, guess what truth it is. You point it out and you say, this is bothering me. So that's why I said sometimes use the symptoms that you're observing to help that person see. You know, you're not sleeping, you're up. And that may connect. Or the other thing is to not say that it's your problem. I'll go with you. Let's make an appointment and I'll go with you. Because mm. many times... An individual knows that their behavior is not where it should be, but they, he or she may not know what to do about it or might be uncomfortable doing something. So we gradually okay. have to do that. Mm -hmm. And you can't fix denial by arguing, argumentative be mannerisms oh, right. and right. complaining. You have to use other approaches. Okay, good. A excellent advice. Um, also, what about um, Alzheimer's uh, disease? Um, and probably a lot of us on this webinar are, are at least familiar with that. Um, and that's kind of a growing uh, disease here as um, as people are aging, you yes. know, the baby boomers. Yes. We yes. keep talking yes. about that. Um, and there's a lot of different um, symptoms involved with that. Um, do you do any outreach with NOMNI with um, people experiencing Alzheimer's or? Not in that large content because there is an Alzheimer's association. Okay. I've been on, I've been in programs where we have been there um, in the same program and same panels and what have you. But Alzheimer's, um, we see it as a, again, gerontology illness, although some younger people have it, not much younger than 40. So it's not in the same category. Yes, there are some brain dysfunctions right. some brain changes, but it's not necessarily, and we know that medication necessarily has not yet proven to change the, right. the road to Alzheimer's. It may slow it down, but it doesn't change and alter like medications in many times for mental illness can slow it down and even alter the thought processes right. and that hasn't happened so um i think those individuals and we don't do our classes don't really address alzheimer's as one of the entities oh i don't all right um but we do you know not just talking off the top of my nurse head right because i'm but, so glad you have that background yes, too. yeah but um i think again you need to get that person the best support he or she needs and to identify. We do say that with Alzheimer's, the earlier you identify it, the, the, the quicker you can get the support and learn strategies to help that person right. until the um, last stages of it occur. Well, and I'm glad actually that this kind of question came in because I think a lot of people um, view the elderly and forget their mental health needs. Yeah. Um, they are experiencing isolation mm -hmm. at times, yeah. you know, as their um, families, members might die and pass on, they might lose their work connections, um, feelings of loneliness, yeah. um, 
a lot of times with the elderly, we're focused very much on physical care because yes. that's a big part yes. of their life at times. Yes. But we kind of don't include them in that mental health arena. But of course, their needs haven't changed just as yes. an adult. Again, we're not talking about adolescents during this webinar or, or children, but um, really the elderly. And you yeah, mentioned right. it. Wow, yeah. it's the suicide rate. The suicide rate among men, the elderly yeah. has increased a lot. And that's one of the reasons we believe because of the isolation, um, feeling not a part of the community. Uh, and many times the alcoholism. Because mm. now, the, now mental health, we talk a lot in outside about the behavior health. Right. The programs they are geared to mental health and behavioral health. And so they've sort of included mental health as well as substance abuse and use in that same right. umbrella. Right. That's what the, that's what the society outside is doing there. Because what we recognize is that many people who have a mental illness also have a substance abuse because that's how they self-medicate. Right. And they do that for years. And we think that they are alcoholic or drug abuser where many times they've been self-medicating for years. Mm -hmm. And people will tell you they stop drinking and they stop using alcohol, but still they have distorted mm -hmm. thought processes. Mm -hmm. And then they recognize they need that. So we're now trying to do both of those at the same time, right. recognizing which is which is the alcohol and the uh, drug use or abuse, and then sort that out and see whether that, that needs to be treated as well as a mental illness. Yes, yes. And so those are things that we need to, because people will see what is comforting and what gives That's relief. right. And what's available and what's quickly. Available and <laughs> yeah. Available. And what's available quickly. Yeah. And, and also, too, that, again, bringing that back to our faith community, even those different outreaches to people who are isolated, yeah. um, uh, that could be done through phone calls as a church ministry as well. Um, of course, visits yes. are, 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 are another way that kind of helps uh, people to not begin that process of that isolation yes. and loneliness, which can lead to those mental illnesses mm -hmm. as well. And you brought a thought to my mind just now, Rachel. I'm going back in my head. Many churches had AA meetings. That's right. That's Many right. Many churches way have had AA meetings mm -hmm. for years. And so now we need to think about how to bring the mental health component That's in. Right. And you don't have to be a professional, like you said, organization like NAMI. Most of the people there, they may have a profession, but that's not what brought them to NAMI. Right. They, they came because they had a family member. Somebody said, oh, I thought you had a PhD in <laughs> mental health. I said, I have degrees, but my degree came from my son and my associating yeah, with him mm -hmm. and how I learned and how I learned to support my family. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about in that same content. AA meetings, that's where most of them were held. In yeah, church basements. Church basements, yeah. yeah. And so now we That's need to right. think about bringing other things into those areas, like the programs we're talking about. Right. To help the individual recognize that um, being just having in the church is a sign that I'm accepted. That's right. That's right. And kind of that, that sign of the um, outreach. Yes. And, and I think, too, is um, as well as, as our faith community um, is helping, again, I know we've said it several times, but helping to reduce that stigma is, is so critical. And when our faith community accepts the person, which isn't always easy, right, Jean? <laughs> I know you've worked many yes, years. Yes. It, it, it can be difficult when a person is experiencing a lot of their symptoms, yes. a height of their yes. symptoms, that they could be angry with you, yes. right? They could... Um, start making even um, accusations. Yes. You're not helping me. Yes, yes, Why aren't yes. you? I thought you were a, 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 a church staff and you're not giving yeah. me those things I need. So what advice can we give to those church ministers that are kind of are there and, and they're experiencing that? It can be tough yeah. to get yeah, those other another, side of it. You know? We have another uh, program that it's not utilized as much as it should be. And that's, uh, a NAMI program. It is for providers and it's not necessarily clinical providers. We even give it to doctors and certain ministers and teachers, people that encounter people yes. on a regular basis. That's one of the reasons we want to go in schools to help teachers 
recognize that this is not a bad child, but a child that needs some other kinds of interventions. Right. And so that's the same thing with the uh, the church. What do you do um, right. when you see behaviors? No one is expected to tolerate inappropriate behavior. You absolutely yes, don't want your right. services disrupted. But if the individual is not being disrupted, then that should not be a problem for the church. That's right. And we kind of talk about as we get to know our parishioners yes. well and knowing about them, then we can respond more in that's, a compassionate way. That's right. You're right. That's, we that's, can't have the mass that's <laughs> disrupted the key. That's all the, the time. That's the key yeah. is to be able to get to know. That's right. And not move away. Right, right, right. And, and in defense of all who move away, I understand fear and feeling I don't know what to do, so we avoid this situation, and that mm-hmm. means removing ourselves from it. And I think I've experienced too with some parishes that have been successful ministries is really um, thinking about the individual ministers at a parish and who has those gifts because <laughs> we all do have different gifts even as ministers and Absolutely. some of our skills may be more able to uh have uh deal with children yeah. but some of us even in our own parishes have that gift and skill to be able to talk with someone that's experiencing a height of a symptom Absolutely. Um, and some others might not have patience <laughs> so and then you have to reflect on ourselves yes. as a minister yeah and that the key is again recognizing what your skill set is right right some have it and some don't and that's okay yeah because every nurse does not identify <laughs> with mental illness every doctor that's why we have psychiatrists in different uh, disciplines, but even within medicine, right? Exactly. So, so why should it not be in the human community to, to in total? Exactly. Um, thank you so much, Jean. So, at, and pointing to resources here, and um, uh, as Jean pointed out so so wonderfully that we do have some resources here, and it's available also as well as a handout with this webinar. Um, and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, has um, examples of prayers of the faithful that can be used at any mass, but we might want to think particularly in May and October, uh, building that awareness. And also the National Catholic Partnership has a resource called uh, Welcomed and Valued, uh, which has a toolkit for a parish on, um, on welcoming those living with mental illness and in that particular resource, they talk about an approach, just as Jean mentioned, where we're speaking to the spiritual needs of the person, but also making sure they get their um, seeing those doctors and those professionals. So they really talk about that in that resource, welcomed and valued. Um, we also have Catholic Charities, which has many services, and they do have core services available uh, with referrals. Um, but I also I put on here as well, you can explore that, but this is for their anchor counseling services, which is a fee for service counseling. And they do have other services available and they could help um, a, a church that's meeting someone in their parish that might need that help. Uh, Mental Health Ministries, again, has a lot of different resources for our faith community on ways to pray and ways to reach out. And that is a uh, Christian-based resource, Interfaith. And we did touch on very briefly um, about suicide prevention. And this hotline, again, is a resource we should all have as church ministers in case someone does come to us and um, um, uh, and we can have this available and sit there with them and call them together to help mm-hmm. in that prevention. Uh, now, and Jean pointed out for me, and again, we'll correct this later on our Archdiocese mm-hmm. website, that I have the contact information for the Nomni chapters in our archdiocese, but of course Nomni is a national organization. So if you're with us outside of the Archdiocese of Washington, uh, you can also go to nomni.org and find your chapter. Um, And I do have the information for our archdiocese specifically. Uh, Jean is with the Nomni DC chapter, and there's a chapter in Prince George's, Montgomery, 
and Southern Maryland also uh, supports Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's. So please uh, include these in your resources, or if you're a family member listening on the webinar, do not hesitate to reach out to those chapters, or again, you can go to nomni.org if you are not sure of uh, which chapter might be serving and your area. And they'll be very glad to help you. And also, nomni.org has many resources, too, again, with that awareness building. Um, they have many different uh, posters and handouts you can print and download as well. And again, resources for you as a family member and an individual as well, if you're a person living with mental illness and you're not sure where to turn. Also, I'd like to invite everyone to our annual White Mass, which we celebrate all persons that we support in our archdiocese, um, people living with disabilities, people living with mental illness, um, and persons who are deaf. Uh, that will be on Sunday, October 27, 1130 a.m., and we welcome our Archbishop Wilton Gregory, who will be our principal celebrant for this Mass. Uh, we're so pleased he'll be able to join us for that. And that is held again. Um, at the Cathedral of St. Matthew the Apostle there in Northwest Washington. And please join us for our Lunch and Learn in August, where we will discuss adult formation. Uh, specifically this time, we will talk about adult formation for adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, all of us need to continue to grow in our faith as adults, and um, we cannot forget the people and adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, and they want to be included too and learn more about their faith. So, so how can we do that? So please join us for a discussion. And again, we open that to ideas and questions as well. And that will be again, August 8th, uh, the second Thursday, again, lunchtime, 12 to 1. So again, thank you, Jean, so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate all the wisdom you bring. Well, thank you <laughs> Not for just inviting. your experience, but your wisdom. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. I was happy to be here today. All right. And again, this uh, PowerPoint and handouts are available with this webinar. And this webinar is recorded. So please uh, check back on our Archdiocese of Washington Department of Special Needs Ministries uh, tab, and you can listen again to this webinar, or please share this um, among your, you know, the families and friends um, that we support, because again, uh, our, our church is a place of welcome, <laughs> and a place where all have to be included into the body of Christ. So thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Jean. Thank you for inviting me.